Good seeing all of you this morning. Thank you for coming out and being a part of our service today. Hallelujah. You having a good week? Good. Well, this morning, I would like for you to turn with me in your Bibles somewhere. If you just open your Bible, it is very likely I'm going to get there at some it's not point today. So, uh, actually, what I'd like for you to do is I want you to turn to uh, Acts, the eighth chapter. We have been looking the last several weeks uh, at right around Easter time on the Easter story, the the passion of Christ, and we have followed that up with different teaching on. Uh, Jesus, the Messiah, the proof of the resurrection is Jesus really the Messiah. And I think that we have looked at that. And, and just mathematically, we ought to be able to see that Jesus is, in fact, who he said that he was. So we looked last week at that proof, and we looked in particular at the story of Peter. Peter said that we have a sh- more sure word of testimony, and he was talking about the word and he was comparing that to the, the evening that Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on Mount Tabor. We know it in our Bible. It's probably a subheading in your Bible somewhere that says the Mount of Transfiguration. So he was talking about that event, and that was a glorious event. I mean, Moses and Elijah show up, and, uh, and, and they hear a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So it is is a tremendous thing. By the way, I want to I want to share something here with your foot. Are you aware that miracles do not produce faith? I'll say that again because some of you right, some of you right now you go wait a minute now. If if I say if 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 there was a miracle that happened right now, I would serve the God the rest of my life. Well, do you know we have in our Bible a story about a group of people that saw the miracles of God every day for over 40 years? The children of Israel. They wandered in the world. They were fed every day. Every morning they went out and there was manna on the ground. And the first day that that happened, they walked out and everybody looked at one another and said, what is it? I don't know. What is it? Do you know what the Hebrew word for what is it is? <laughs> manna. That's what <laughs> manna is not a real spiritual word. Manna just means what is it? So that's that's what the manna was on the ground, and it was a it was a, a, a wafer, a cake that you could take and do all kinds of things with. And then in the afternoon they would have meat. They would have quail that would come in in the afternoon, and God supernaturally fed them for over forty years. Do you imagine how much water it would have taken? to be able to take care of that many people. Uh, Depending on who you're talking to, there were between one and three million people that left, the the Hebrew children that left out of Egypt. Well, you know, on the conservatives, one million people take a lot of water. You know, when Moses hit the rock and and water came out of the rock, it wasn't a garden hose squirting out. I I, I mean, they had already been several days without water. The people at the end of the line would have have, uh, died. When that water came out, it formed a lake because they had animals with them. They had livestock with them. They had, you know, I mean, it just, just the logistics of what it took to take care of those people for 40 days. We find God's protect. We find his provision. We find his protection. You know, the Bible says that their clothes didn't even wear out. Another supernatural miracle. Those people saw the miracles of God every day. Not to mention the miracles that it took just to get them out. Just when they came out of the land, the plagues that came through, how they were delivered from all of that. When Pharaoh's army came after them and the Red Sea was parted, and they went over on the other side and the sea came back in on Pharaoh and his army. God delivered them time and time and time again. And the book of Hebrews tells us that they did not enter into the promised land because they didn't have faith. So seeing miracles of God, seeing the miracles of God will encourage you. 
They will excite you. They'll bless you, but they don't necessarily produce faith in your life. You get faith from the Word of God. That's what the Bible says, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Where do you get faith? By hearing the Word of God. You get faith from the Word. So that's what happens. That, that's one of the things that excites us. As we get into the Bible, as we get into the Word, we start hearing it in a way that we can understand it. And because we understand it, then faith comes. And now we're able to apply the Word in our life. And it works. You know, I remember, I guess it was back in about 1979. I remember the day that I got the revelation that, hey, I can actually take what the Bible says and apply it to my life and have what the Bible says that I'll have. I'll have what the Bible says that I'll have. That was a revelation. That's applying faith. And so what happens as we get into the Word, that faith grows. Faith is, uh, the, the Bible says that there, Jesus used examples of there's no faith. <clears throat> there's little faith and there's great faith. So your faith can grow. You, you can even have little faith in one area and great faith in another area in your life. So uh, we, the, Peter said that although we were there that night, Mount of Transfiguration, we have a more sure word. And he's talking about the, the, the scriptures. He said, this seed that you're born again of, you're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. So it's the seed of the Word that causes us to be born again, to be born into the kingdom of God. So we looked at what happened in Peter's life. You remember, Peter, when, he, uh, uh, when Jesus was betrayed that night, Peter cut off Malchus's ear. Uh, Peter was, was scared. But he kind of went around to see what was going on. He followed Jesus around the night uh, that he was betrayed and went to the trials. He went before the Sanhedrin. And, and Peter would kind of just go around and, and look and see what was going on. And three times he was asked if he, if he knew him, if he knew Jesus. And he denied Jesus three times, and uh, uh, just as Jesus had prophesied to him. So we find that there was a big change in him that happened. After the day of Pentecost, we find Peter preaching to the crowds in Jerusalem, and, and thousands were saved that particular day. Another one, another person that we mentioned last week that we're going to go into more detail this morning was the Apostle Paul. So I want you to look with me in chapter 8 here. Actually, I want you to look with me in chapter 7, verse 51. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Now, one of the things that has happened is they have, uh, they have elected, if you will, the church in Jerusalem have elected uh, seven men to start operating as deacons to help wait on the tables. What has happened is the church has grown so much that, that the, the apostles that are still there, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the pastor there. And so the, the church is growing, and what is happening is, is they come to the realization, we cannot do everything. We have got to get some help from people. And so they were serving people. They were help serving people food. They were feeding the poor. And so the, the apostles were out there helping them. Well, they said, you know, it, it, it would be better for us if we were spending time praying and studying instead of doing the tables. Not that they, that was beneath them. But they needed to be doing other things so that they could be able to minister to the people uh, uh, spiritual things. So they said, let's pick out uh, uh, some people. And so one of the people that they picked out uh, was named Stephen. And Stephen was a mighty man of God, full of faith and full of the Spirit, the power of God. And so what happens is, is there's, uh, he has a boldness. And in chapter 7, um, Stephen begins to preach and he begins to preach in front of the religious leaders of the city now you've got to understand that when you start sharing the word with religious people it gets them upset 
it stirs up that religious devil that's on the inside of them. It'll make them mad. And it'll make them mad to where they do foolish things. It'll, and, and, and what happens is, what I'm talking about in particular is, is when you're talking to somebody that is religious-minded, you can show them in the Word where it says something, and they will still go with what it is that they've heard their whole life, even though it's contrary to what the Word says. You're not going to get the victory. A person's not going to get the victory if, if they act that way. And so what happened is these people, Jesus faced the same group. The same thing happened with Jesus. He would face the religious-minded people. He would share, them the truth, share with them the truth of the Scriptures, our Old Testament, uh, and, and they wouldn't see it, or they didn't want to see it, because it messed up what they had going on. And so not only that, but, but they, Jesus would show them up to where finally they plotted to kill him. So I, I'm telling you, people that are religious-minded can be stinkers. And so this is what happens to Philip, uh, Stephen. Stephen's preaching the word here in verse 51. <laughs> of course, you know, when you, when you say this to somebody, you might get them a little angry at you. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears. Now you have to understand, when you are talking to Jewish leaders and you accuse them of being uncircumcised in anything, you're going to get them mad. Because that was the sign of the covenant. That was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. That is what distinguished them. That is what made them different than anybody else. And so now when you accuse them and say, you're uncircumcised, and he said uncircumcised in your heart, it, 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 you know it's going to rile them up. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? <laughs> I mean, name one. Name one of the prophets that your fathers didn't persecute. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now, you know, you would think at that point that, that, that Stephen, now this is, this is the tail end of the sermon that we're looking at. He, he's been teaching all through the whole, whole chapter 7. And it was good. And he was explaining how through Abraham, how Jesus came through Abraham and how God sent the prophets. I mean, it's a really good sermon. Now, you would think at that point that they would look at that and go, you know, you're right. I don't know how in the world we have been so blind that we haven't seen that. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. They didn't do that. As a matter of fact, in the next verse, when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, this expression, gnashed at them with their teeth, means they could have just kind of chomped their teeth at him. It can also mean, literally, they tried to bite him. They were so mad that they tried to bite Have you ever seen a little child, a little toddler get mad? They get mad, especially at another little toddler. What is one of the things that they do to that other child? When they get mad, when they don't get their way, and they lose their temper, what do they do? Bite them. So that's what happened to these spiritual little children. Apparently, they got so mad, they were ready to bite something. They were ready to bite Stephen. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city. And stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And when they had stoned him, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I personally believe that Stephen was delivered here. Now, he died. But I believe that from the pain and the anguish of being stoned, and, and the reason that I say that is this, is because at the beginning of this, he said, 
I look and see heaven opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you remember over, I think it's about the 33rd chapter of Exodus, somewhere around in there, uh, Moses asked God, he said, I want to see your glory. And the Lord told him a very interesting, this is when he put him in the cleft of the rock and walked by him and put his hand out so that he couldn't see him. And he only looked on the, his hinder part. <laughs> Uh, he, in other words, he only saw the back of God walk in front of him. This is when he came down off the mountain and, and had the glow about him, and they had to put a bell over his face because he scared the people because that, that glory of God was on Moses. That's why you see Michelangelo's uh, painting uh, in, in the sculpture of Moses. You see him sitting there with the tablets with horns coming out of his head. And, and I remember when I first saw that, I went, well, why in the world is the devil holding the Ten Commandments? That didn't make sense to me. It still wouldn't make sense to me today. But what happened is that word, I believe it's the Latin word for the rays that were shooting out of his head is actually horned. It can be translated as horned. And so they, it's kind of a mistranslation when he did that. But what happened is, is his, his face shot rays. In other words, his, his face, there was a, a, a brightness. There was an anointing, uh, uh, the glory of God that came. And it's, like I said, it scared the people to where they had to veil his face for that. That was just looking at the backside of God. And, and when, when Moses asked God, he said, I, I want to I see your glory. The Lord told him something very interesting. He said, Moses, he said, no man can look upon my glory and live. If you look on the face of God, your, your body cannot take it. So if you look on the face of God, you're going home. I believe that's exactly what happened here. I believe that, that from that point, after he delivered the sermon, and then they were gnashing at him with their teeth, and, and, and they started, and then they drug him out to, to stone him. From that time on, he felt no pain whatsoever. And, and, and I believe that his spirit, that God snatched him out of it. That's my opinion. This is not a heaven or hell issue, okay? It's just, it's just my opinion. Verse 8, or chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. So then we have in chapter 8, Philip goes down to Samaria. And uh, uh, so Paul now is asking in chapter, go over with me to chapter 9. Now, you have to wonder, if is the Apostle Paul's life really important? Well, we're going to start looking here in chapter 9 today. We're not going to read all of this, but we're going to be looking at also some things over in chapter 26 of the Apostle Paul. Most of the book of Acts deals with the teachings and the advancement of the gospel through the Apostle Paul. Now, there's others. Peter also in here. But uh, uh, especially early on, but then it's it's Paul that kind of takes the center stage as he uh, begins preaching the gospel to uh, the Gentiles. Chapter nine in verse one. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder, what does that say in your Bible? Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, that's what this new movement of Christianity was being called, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, you just read in verse 1, what was his intention? Verse 1 was, to, was for them to be executed. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around. For, okay. Just to kind of put things in perspective for you, Saul is not from Jerusalem. Now, he was trained in Jerusalem. Uh, Gamil is who he, he trained under, one of the finest teachers of the day. Paul was very smart. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was a zealot. He followed the law strictly and it aggravated him that this, he called it the way. See, at this point, they weren't called Christians. <laughs> Ironically, 
this way is called Christians first at Antioch because of Paul's preaching. <laughs> so, that's interesting. so, but it, it was just called this way or the the way, this new way. And and what happened is is you've got to understand that the people that that the way was affecting at first what were Jews was the nation of Israel. It it hadn't gotten to the Gentiles yet. And so what happened is it was beginning to affect the nation of Israel and Jews, and it was beginning to spread. We kind of skipped over it a little bit uh, in, in chapter 8, but Philip preached to Samaria. He, he, had, he had gone into Samaria. Now, the Apostle Paul is from Tarsus, not Tarshish. Tarshish is in Spain. That's where Jonah was going, okay? That was the known end of the world was Tarshish. Paul is from Tarsus, which is in Turkey, Asia Minor. So he has been in Jerusalem. This is where this happened. He's in Jerusalem, and he's getting ready to go back home. He's getting ready to head back to um, his, his hometown of Tarsus. Well, uh, on the way is Damascus, Syria. So he goes to the priest, and he says, listen. I'm going to be going this way anyway. And if you will give me official letters, I'll hunt these people down. And I'll gather them up and have bound and send them to Jerusalem. You can do with them what you want to. So he goes to Damascus. He's, he's heading uh, up there to, remember we just read at the beginning, he, he, he is threatening and, and, and murder is in his heart towards these people. Now, he thinks he's doing right. He thinks he is serving God. But he's coming against this new move, if you will, that has come out. Verse 3. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round uh, him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? I always think this is interesting. He didn't know who he was, but a voice coming from heaven, we're going to cover our bases, and whoever it is, we're going to call him Lord, okay? Because this is a... Do you realize, uh, the when Jesus showed up here, the power of God was in such manifestation, it knocked Paul to the ground. Who are you? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. Or, or uh, some translations say pricks. A goad is, is simp was simply a ball that had thorns. It was just homemade. Just, just a, 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 it was a, a plant pod with thorns coming out of it that they used to move livestock with. And that would have been very difficult to kick against. That would have hurt if you, if you would have done that. And so that's what Jesus said. He said, it's very hard for you to kick against this. And I want you to also notice this. The attack that the Apostle Paul has on, it, it's not, the, the, well, I guess, yeah, it is technically the church. The attack that he has on the church, Jesus takes it personally. Jesus said, you're doing it against me. You, you are attacking me. You're persecuting me. And, and one of the reasons one of the things that I have to be careful of this morning, I was talking to Andrew about that this morning. There are so many ways you can go. When you start talking about the life of the Apostle Paul, that, I mean, we could spend a year on it. But one of the things that I want you to notice is this. And I, and I, I'm, I don't have time to go into this in detail. I've taught on it in detail before, and you just have to go back and, and listen to some of those things. But I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you that the, of the way that authority operates in the earth. If you'll remember in Genesis chapter 1, see, I told you earlier today, if you just pick a book in the Bible, I'd probably get there. Okay, we, we've hit several of them already. Uh, but in Genesis chapter 1, if you remember verse 26, uh, the Bible's talking uh, there, and, and, and the Bible says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And let him have, and so he's talking about dominion. And so then it goes on and says, and the Lord blessed them. 
Now, the word blessed there means to empower. Okay? So, the Lord empowered Adam, and he gave him dominion. And the thing that he gave him dominion over was this planet. So, he gave him the power to rule it, and he gave him the authority to rule it. Right? It's in your Bible, Genesis chapter 1. So, things are going along pretty good. In, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, Eve comes on the scene. And uh, then in chapter 3, we have a problem. And we have a fallen, renegade archangel that now comes into the garden. And I have a whole, actually it's not a sermon, it is a four-part series on why he came into the garden and, why he, and what he was trying to do by coming into the garden but I'm not going to tell you what that is because you get distracted on that. I'm, try, I'm getting distracted on it myself. So, back to this. So, this renegade archangel comes in and deceives Adam and Eve. Now, what happens at that point, you have to understand, is the authority that has been given to Adam has now been given over to Lucifer. Lucifer didn't come in by war and take it. He came in by deception to where Adam gave it to him. Now, how did Adam do that? I don't see in there where Adam gave that. The way that Adam gave it to him was by disobeying what God told him to do. God told him, you can eat of everything in here. I've made everything good for you to eat, except there's one tree that you can't eat, and that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the area that the enemy comes in to tempt Adam and Eve, and so they eat of that tree, and they are disobedient. That disobedience robbed them of the authority that God had given them. All right, now let's just, that's just real easy here. Not going to be very difficult. This is an open book test. You can use your Bibles for this. God gave the authority in Genesis chapter 1 to who? Adam. Adam, in chapter 3 of Genesis, turns that authority over to the devil, or Lucifer. So, who has the authority in the earth today? This is not a trick question. Now, see, right now, that religious devil on the inside of some of you are going, nah, wait a minute, it, it, it's, going, it's going sideways. C come on, look at your Bible. The authority, in the, the authority in the earth system is no longer in charge by God's man in the earth. It is now being run by a fallen, renegade archangel that led an uprising against God in heaven. Now then, for just a moment, I want you to take a look at what's going on on the earth today. Does it appear to you that God is the one that's running all of this? Or does it appear to you that a renegade fallen spirit is the one that's running all this today? I mean, come on. You have to go to church to believe that God's running all this. Anybody with half a brain can look and see that that, that cannot be. Those two not... I mean, if he is, he's doing an incredibly lousy job of it. I know that made some of you mad, but it's the truth. Now, God is in authority, or sovereign, we love to use that word. God is sovereign in his kingdom. Jesus came to the earth to help restore that kingdom to man, or to give man the ability to be in that kingdom. But that didn't change the way that things are on the earth today. What it enabled, what, what it set up for, is for man to be able to be born again out of spiritual death into that kingdom. When you are born into the kingdom of God, who is in control of your life, or should be? God is. To the extent that you will let Him, that you will allow Him. So, is God in control where your life is concerned? To the degree that you let Him, He is, because you're in that kingdom. 
But to say that God's in control of what's going on here in the world is simply not true. And you see how it starts messing your doctrine up because you look at sickness and disease and famine that's going on the earth. Well, you see that's happening. If you believe that God's in control, now you have to justify why He's letting that happen. If He's in control and He is a loving God, why are people dying at the rate they're dying? Well, you see, it's just in God's... And we start with this stuff that just makes no sense whatsoever. And people that are in the world look at that and go, there is no way that's right. And it confuses them. It confuses Christians. You have to understand that on this... We've had a lot of trouble with certain things where this is concerned lately, but let me, let me help you with this. On the earth today, there are two races. Two. I know y'all are ready for me to go ahead and explain that. Two races on the earth. There, there is a race of people on the earth that are still in the kingdom of darkness. And there is a race on the earth that have been translated from that into the kingdom of light. Okay? So there's two kingdoms operating in the earth today. The kingdom of darkness is trying to undermine God's plan and God's kingdom in the earth. So the enemy tries to attack you. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he tries to kill, steal, and destroy you. Now, my brother and sister, you can't get any plainer than that. Jesus, written in red in your official Bible, says that the enemy kills, steals, and destroys. Okay? Just real simple here. If something is trying to kill you, if something is trying to steal from you, if something is trying to destroy you, is it God? According to Jesus, the Son of God, God in flesh, according to Him, if it's killing, stealing, or destroying, who is it that's trying to do that to you? The devil. Now that to me seems to be very simple. As a matter of fact, I, believe, I, I look at this as one of those dividing scriptures. You know, the Apostle Paul says to rightly divide the word of truth. You remember Paul, we were talking about him a little while ago. Rightly divide the word of truth. John 10, 10. So, you're going through, you love God with all of your heart. You, you, you believe the word. You're doing everything you can. And all of a sudden, something bad comes against you. And so, we think it's God bringing that against us some, to somehow test us, to try us, in order to perfect us. Not according to John 10.10, 10, it's not. What it is, it's the enemy trying to come in and attack you and make you give up on God's plan in your life. He's trying to undermine God's plan in your life. Now, I want to tell you something. If you get a hold of that, it will really help you. God is not your enemy in anything. So. The authority that's in the world's system today is the. Doesn't the Apostle Paul call, refer to the devil as the God of this world? It's in your Bible. How in the world do we see things like that and still think that, well, you know, this is all you getting sick and this person dying and stuff like that's all part of God's plan? Was it killing, stealing, or destroying? Then it wasn't God's plan. God's plan, one of, the, one of the places that we find is Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. I mean, I love verses of Scripture in our Bible that give us a, a hint at, or give us pieces of what God's plan is in our life. Matter of fact, if you don't have Jeremiah 29, 11 underlined in your Bible, you need to underline it in your Bible. Uh, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace 
<laughs> Doesn't it say in there somewhere, thoughts of peace and not of evil? Does it say that in your Bible? Yes, it does. To give you a hope in a future. He said, These are the thought, this is the way that I think towards you. I, I, I think that I want you to have peace in the future. I don't have evil things towards you. I, I, I want you to, uh, a New International version, version says that he wants you to prosper. That's, God thinks good things towards you. God desires good things to happen to you. Not evil things. So, the authority that's in the earth today, bringing this back around to what I was teaching on, the authority that's in the earth today, God's authority in the earth today is through His body, the church. In order, you need to write this down if you hadn't written it down before. In order to exercise authority in the earth, you have to have a body. A spirit without a body has no authority on this planet right now. It doesn't. If you'll think with me for just a moment, God Himself in order to redeem mankind, had to have a body. And we know God in a body as Jesus. That's who Jesus is. He is the Word in flesh. I mean, God could, couldn't God have just showed up here in, in, in all of His glory and come off of the throne and just made everybody get saved? No. Well, he's God. He can do anything. He cannot violate his word. Had he done that, he would have violated his word. And now then the thing that the devil had designed for, for however a billion years, I don't know how long ago the, revel, the, the uh, 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 uprising happened in heaven when the devil led a third of the angels against the throne of God. But had God done that, had he come in and just said, all right, we need to start this over. I can't believe you did this, Adam. And then God just showed up here on the earth to redeem mankind. He would have violated his word, and that would have given the devil the authority to exalt his throne above God. And so then, instead of just ruling the earth, he would have ruled heaven, and that would have really been a mess. Do you, you, you see how all this kind of, all, all this kind of works. So you've got to have a body to exercise authority in the earth. So Jesus tells us, he told his disciples this. They didn't catch it. They didn't really understand what he was talking about. In John chapter 14, he said, the works that I do, you're going to do also and greater works than these because I go to my Father which is in heaven because I'm going to send you a comforter. And when he's come, he's going to lead you and guide you and equip you and, and empower you. And, and, and all. Now you go wait in Jerusalem until that power has come from on high. And then you're going to be witnesses, powerful witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And so that's what starts happening on the day of Pentecost is the body of Christ, who is God's authority in the earth, begins to spread. And it makes the religious people mad, just like it does today. Those religious people, they still have relatives that are around today. And it made the religious people angry, to the point of hunting them down and killing them. And there was none that was more zealous for this task than Saul of Tarsus. Until he met Jesus on the way to Damascus. And so Jesus tells him, he said, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Verse 6. Y'all didn't know all that was contained in verse 5, did you? That, that, that's why you have me. Verse 6, so he, trembling and astonished, said, now remember the, the writer of the book of Acts is Luke, the one that wrote the gospel, Luke. So it's Luke that's writing this account. So he, that's Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. All right, do you understand that this, this tremendous event that happened with Saul of Tarsus, the people that were with him heard it also. 
This is not, my point being, this was not Saul's imagination. He hadn't gotten into some bad mushrooms and was hallucinating on the way to Damascus. The, the people that were in the entourage with him heard it also. They were astonished because they heard a voice, but they couldn't see anything. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight and neither ate or drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, or go to Straight Street, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. <laughs> and Ananias says, Lord, you must have the wrong address. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, Lord, but the Saul of Tarsus that you just mentioned has been hunting down Christians and killing them. Surely we have our wires crossed. Surely I misunderstood what it was. Did you say Saul of Tarsus? I, uh, Lord, I don't. I mean, all the harm that he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's been given authority, verse 14. He's been given authority by the chief priest to bind everybody in your name. They'll bind me up and send me off to prison. But the Lord said to him, Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, I'm going to go ahead on to the end of the story here, but I want you to notice verse 16. I want you to pay very close attention to verse 16 here. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Just keep that in mind. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. Oh, by the way, at the end of verse 17 there, at the end of verse 17, I want you to notice something. I want to ask you this question. Has the Apostle Paul been saved? Has he been converted? Yes. On, on Damascus, on the, when he got knocked off his donkey. That's when he accepted Jesus as Lord, wasn't it? Started calling him Lord. I mean, if we're going by what he said, started calling him Lord. Referring to him as Lord. That's when he accepted him as Lord. I want you to know that there's another event here in the end of verse 17. He has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is another example in the Bible that the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the, the filling of the Spirit. We have different words for it, being Spirit-filled, baptism of the Holy Spirit. That, that it's a different, it, it's, a, it's a subsequent event. It's an empowering. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent a day, or sent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he begins, look at this. So he spent some days with the, with, with the disciples there in Damascus, and notice what he starts doing. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogue that he was the Son of God. Now, you've got to understand the turmoil that would be going on at this time. He has... Everybody knows who this guy is. When Saul came to town with the entourage, you hid. And now this person is standing in the synagogue and teaching that Christ is the Messiah. What a turn of event. Now, one of the things that I want to point out here, and we're going to close here for today, uh, I didn't even... Not only did I not finish today, I couldn't even see the finish from where I got to today. So we'll continue. But I want to, to leave you with this uh, 
in verse 16. When the Lord is telling Ananias this, He says, For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Bible tells us that persecution arises for the word's sake. When, when, when a person is preaching the word, persecution will come to try to take that away. And what happens with the Apostle Paul? Have you heard the expression, the hunter has become the hunted? Well, the persecutor has become the persecuted. So, the, the fervor that he has been persecuting the church is now starts to change and that starts to come against him. And the Lord showed him, he, he, he told Ananias, he said, I've got to show him what's going to happen to him if he does this. Now you know the Lord showed him what was going to happen. He showed him what was going to happen him preaching. He showed him that he was going to be beaten as a result of it. He was going to be stoned as a result of it. He was going to be shipwrecked as a result. All the things that were going to come against him. And remember we've been talking about proof of the resurrection. We've been talking about proof of, of, of a change in a person's life. With all of that being revealed to him. There had been such a change in his heart that he was willing to go through with the assignment that God had given him. That doesn't just happen because you kind of think maybe something might be real or it might not. It was a real experience that happened with him on the road to Damascus. It was a real experience that happened with him with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he immediately began to teach boldly the gospel with Jesus as the Messiah. Listen. Uh, you will find that, that the church, and particularly Paul, Paul never preached against the Scriptures. He never preached against the Old Testament that they have. What he preached was, this is pointing to Jesus. Jesus is who this was talking about. He, doesn't, he didn't try to do away with that. He just tried to shine light upon it. You know, one of the things that I found over the years, some people don't like the light shined on stuff in their life. They get really upset about it. But I want to tell you something, when you come to Jesus, it will be an experience in your life that will change you forever. There, there is a spirit of love and peace and, and, and comfort and security that you cannot imagine when you come to Him. Now, all of you in here today, if you'd bow your head and close your eyes, if there's anybody here today that you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and those of you that are listening uh, by a media outlet, I want you to participate in this also. Any of you that haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no day like today. Today, the Bible says, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. So if that's you, and you believe right now you'd like to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Would you just slip up your hand for me, please? Anybody at all in the place? Anybody slipping up hand? Anybody? Those of you that are out there listening, any of you that would like to make Jesus Christ Lord, it's Lord of your life, it's a very simple thing. I'm going to say this prayer, and I'd like for you to repeat this prayer with me. Those of you here in the church, would you please repeat it also, and let's help them. Father, I thank you so much for your love that you have given to me. You love me so much that you sent Jesus to die for me so that I could live forever with you. I confess now before heaven and earth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, and I will serve him as such. Thank you for accepting me into the kingdom of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I love you, Father. Thank you for loving me. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there is victory in Jesus.